What's up guys, my name is Robert Donaldson, and in today's video, if you haven't already noticed by the title, we'll be tackling one of the existential questions facing the Iowa football program over the past decade, and that question is, why can't Iowa beat Wisconsin? And this video is actually going to be the first installment in a series of videos, so if you'd like to see more of this, be sure to like it up on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or wherever else you're seeing this, and there will definitely be more coming your way. Over the past decade, Iowa's experienced changes in personnel coordinators, position coaches, evolving philosophies, and also changes to the landscape of college football and how it's played. However, one of the constants over the past decade is that Iowa football just can't seem to beat Wisconsin. So what's the deal? And right out of the gate, there's a few things we have to acknowledge. And the first thing is that over the past decade, Wisconsin has undoubtedly been the more successful football program overall, and it's shown up in their 64 in-conference wins in the Big Ten as compared to Iowa's 48. And even more recently, it's shown in the fact that the Badgers have taken six trips to the Big Ten championship game since it began back in 2011 compared to Iowa's one trip in 2015. When you look at Wisconsin as a program, they've done such a great job at building a national brand around what their strengths are on the field. They have a great defense, they're disciplined, they're physical, and what most people would say is the program's greatest strength, they have a great rushing attack. So let's start right there. The Wisconsin running game has been revered for nearly three decades now, going back to when they had a running back named Ron Dane, who was shattering all the program's rushing records back in the mid to late 90s. And fast forward to today, and the Badgers are still seen as one of the premier running teams in all of the nation with guys like Monty Ball, James White, Melvin Gordon, Corey Clement, and most recently, Jonathan Taylor. Dating back to 2016, when this most recent four game losing streak to Wisconsin began, Wisconsin has totaled nearly 1,000 yards rushing in those four games, while also averaging nearly six yards per carry, which is obviously some really great production. And in comparison, in that same span, Iowa's rushing attack has totaled only 389 yards, while only averaging 4.4 yards per carry. And even on the surface, without context, the difference in those numbers is large and notable especially when you consider that Iowa's MO on offense is all about establishing the run game. When making note of that difference, the first place you should look at is the O-line. And when comparing Wisconsin and Iowa, a lot of people seem to believe that they are clone programs or twin programs. And in reality, they aren't. Do I think that they have similar philosophies and similar ways of going about things? Sure. But the way they operate is very different and comparatively, their personnel comes in different sizes and the way they operate specifically on the offensive line with their blocking scheme is completely different compared to the Hawkeyes. The first thing you'll notice with the personnel Wisconsin has on their offensive line is that year to year, they're typically going to be much bigger at each position and much more physical inside and out than the guys Iowa has on their offensive line. And the past few years have been the uh, exception at left and right tackle, considering Iowa's had two uncharacteristically huge tackles in the form of Tristan Wirfs and Alaric Jackson, lining up at both right tackle and left tackle. And the difference in size and strength from an individual player standpoint has a lot to do with that difference in blocking scheme as Wisconsin runs a man blocking scheme, or maybe you've heard it called a gap blocking scheme, compared to Iowa who runs a primarily zone blocking scheme. Without going too in depth right now, the biggest difference between the two schemes is that in a man blocking scheme, there's always gonna be a predetermined running lane through a predetermined gap. And the two offensive linemen who are lined up next to each other in that predetermined running lane are gonna be tasked with opening up that gap. And on both sides of it, the offensive line will be blocking in opposite directions. In a zone blocking scheme, which is what Iowa runs, the offensive line doesn't block in opposite directions. Instead, the whole offensive line moves in unison. So their first step and their first movement will all be in that same direction 
and they're tasked with blocking an area or a zone and the back is in charge of making a read on where to run it based on what he sees. Focusing specifically on Wisconsin's man blocking scheme, knowing those key differences in blocking schemes is incredibly important to acknowledge if you're Iowa's defense, especially if you're a linebacker, because the way you go about reading and play is going to be drastically different when you're facing a man blocking scheme compared to a zone blocking scheme. And I'm sure many of you have probably heard an analyst, commentator, or maybe even a coach talking about linebacker play and how they're supposed to read their keys. And although different coaches have different ways they would like their linebackers to go about reading a play, the general consensus is to key that center and or a linebacker's aligned side guard to the ball, whether the quarterback keeps it for a pass or gives it to a running back. And this is something Iowa linebackers have had many issues with over the years when keying Wisconsin's offensive line in regards to stopping the run. Take this play from last year's matchup with Wisconsin for example. Wisconsin is going to come out in 11 personnel, and 11 personnel just means one back and one tight end, 1-1. One, one. And the formation they line up in is a 3 by one spread formation with trips left. And this look is something you'll see a lot of in the NFL, but Wisconsin head coach Paul Christ also utilizes it quite a bit because it forces opposing defenses to spread out instead of cramming the box with a bunch of extra bodies, which typically is what you prefer to do when you're playing a team that runs the ball like Wisconsin does. Right here, number 32, Damone Colbert, is the only additional defender lined up in the box outside of the four down linemen. And obviously, Wisconsin has five blockers in this formation with their offensive line. So what that means is that in this scenario, if it's a run call, it's going to come down to a battle of execution between Wisconsin's front five and Iowa's front five. And this kind of battle speaks to a mindset that Iowa coaches have really instilled into their program over many decades, going all the way back to Hayden Fry. And that is a high level of trust, accountability, and there's also a true belief that their guys will be able to properly execute their assignments. So if you're on that field, Iowa's coaching staff is going to trust you to do your job because the margin of error when you have even numbers in the box is very small. And right here, Iowa's defense just doesn't execute. With that said, let's focus on Colbert here. Once the ball snapped, Colbert is going to key that right guard and that center to the ball like we mentioned earlier. And right away, it's apparent that that center is blocking to his left to double that D tackle number 91. But the right guard's intention is a little bit less obvious right away. And instead of taking neutral steps and being patient, waiting for the play to develop further, Colbert is gonna sell out to that A gap and he's gonna get caught guessing because as we see, that right guard ends up getting his hips around towards the center and he just moves number 95 out of the right side B gap and with Colbert selling out on his incorrect read, that just leaves a wide open running lane and it could have been an even bigger gain on the play if the safety number 28 doesn't make that one on one tackle in space. This play right here serves as a great example of why going up five versus five or six versus six or maybe even seven v seven in the box on any given play can really backfire because if you didn't notice, in addition to Colbert not making the correct read based on his keys, not a single one of the four down linemen won their individual matchups here either. And that was compounded by Colbert misreading his keys and essentially making it so that both the defensive line and the second level of the defense were completely washed out of this play. And this same issue shows up later on in the same quarter of last year's matchup this time with freshman linebacker Dylan Doyle. On this play, once again, Doyle is supposed to be keying the center and the left guard to the running back. Instead, once the ball snapped, Doyle is just going to key that eye candy right there. And it's immediately clear that the left guard is trying to get his hips around to prevent number 74 from working to his right. And the center is pulling all the way around the edge to the offense's left or the defense is right. But all Doyle sees 
is that really wide opening and the running back and the ball on the other side of it. And that opening right there might as well be called the void because there's nothing there. And unless you're an absolute freak athlete, there's not a play to be made by running through that gap. As the play goes on, Doyle gets momentarily sucked into that opening, as you can see, and instead of working towards the outside, which is what his keys are telling him to do, Doyle takes too long of a peek through that gap, then realizes there's nothing there, and by then, it's too late. The tight end has already worked off his chip block of number 94, and he's in position to meet Doyle square on, and instead of a very small gain or no gain on this play, Taylor goes on to pick up a sizable chunk here on the first play of a drive to get that offense moving down the field. Let's very quickly flash all the way back to 2013's Wisconsin-Iowa game for an example of what good linebacker play in a similar situation looks like when you have a couple guys who are able to read and react correctly and execute based on what their keys are telling them. The players you want to keep an eye on here are number 44 James Morris and number 31 Anthony Hitchens. As you see, Wisconsin comes out lined up at 22 personnel, which just means two tight ends and two backs, 2-2, two -two, and they're just going to line up in a double tight eye formation, but like we've been talking about all video. It might be a different look from Wisconsin here, or a different alignment, but their keys, their linebackers keys are still going to be the same. With this look, Morris is still keying that right guard and that center to the ball, and Hitchens is still keying the left guard and the center to the ball. And once the ball is snapped, you're going to see that right guard pull across the formation in the second that the right guard starts to vacate. Morris does not hesitate whatsoever, and he follows that right guard in lockstep while simultaneously taking a fantastic angle, which puts him right in the middle of that predetermined running lane. On the other side of the formation, you're going to see Hitchens react very quickly to his keys as well, which allows him to process the play almost immediately, and also puts him in the same running lane as Morris and that in turn forces that pulling right guard to account for him and block him, which allows Morris to fill the predetermined running lane that we just mentioned and make it an unavailable option for the running back James White to get vertical here. And from there, Hitchens is gonna show some really great technique taking on that pulling right guard as he attacks half of that guard's body and that's a really important distinction to make because you'll start to notice that too often, Iowa's linebackers in some of their more recent matchups against Wisconsin are instead contact contacting that blocker or blockers square on, which is not how linebackers are taught to attack linemen in space. This technique shown by Hitchens right here is how you attack a pulling or climbing offensive lineman, fullback, or even tight end you rarely want to find yourself as a linebacker taking on a second level block square on because when you do that it puts you at an immediate disadvantage and it's exactly what the blocker wants to have happen. Here's another example from last year's matchup with Wisconsin that shows this exact point. Wisconsin is going to come out in 12 personnel meaning one back, two tight ends, one two and they're going to call a power run to the left here. And simply defined, power run just means that one or more offensive linemen are going to be pulling across the formation. And in this example, the two pulling offensive linemen are the center, Tyler Biotish, and the right tackle, Logan Bruss. And the two Iowa players you want to be keeping your eye on here are number 43, Dylan Doyle, and number 48, Nick Neiman, who ends up sliding in the box last second from that cash spot. Now that you've seen the play in full speed from one angle, let's flip to the end zone angle now to really get a good visual on what's going on here for Iowa's defense. Once the ball snapped, Doyle's keys are once again, and I know you guys are probably getting tired of me saying this, going to be that right guard 
and that center to the ball and right away that right guard is going to win his individual matchup with number 54 Davion Nixon by getting his hips around to the right which is indicating a run left unfortunately Doyle hesitates instead of trusting his keys again which again puts him behind the eight ball and as the play develops Doyle works his way back to the running lane but he's late and instead of attacking half of that pulling right tackle like we just talked about with Hitchens a right tackle by the way who happens to have 80 pounds on him Doyle instead decides to square up and attack that right tackle in his chest which as we just mentioned is not the correct way to go about attacking a blocker in space over here with Neiman his keys tell an even clearer story as the left guard gets his hips around to the right immediately and the center is pulling right into his running lane coming right at him unfortunately Neiman also hesitates on this play and even takes multiple steps back and out of the running lane and much like Doyle instead of being aggressive here and trying to attack half of that pulling center to blow up the lane he chooses to attack the 320 pound center head on which renders him ineffective on this play and as you guys see again Jonathan Taylor rips off another big chunk with all that said there's actually another thing at play here that's a little bit more subtle and it's something that Wisconsin implements a lot nowadays and that's pre-snap to post snap motion and the reason for Wisconsin implementing a lot of motion especially into the run game is really easy to understand because it's a great way to get defenders off of their keys and at times it can be used just to move a defender away from the play side and we just saw that kind of thing with Neiman essentially having to change roles on the fly as he came in from that cash spot in order to play in the box and when Wisconsin does that it can potentially confuse linebackers and defensive backs pre-snap in turn affecting how they read and react to a play post snap this play right here from last year's matchup is a great example of how Wisconsin utilizes pre-snap motion to affect post snap reads and the Iowa player you want to keep an eye on here is once again going to be number 32 Damone Colbert and right here Wisconsin comes lined up in a 12 personnel look with the strong side being to the left but as you can see they're going to quickly shift to that right out of that look and really pay attention to the linebacker movement in reaction to all that motion and then once they've shown you this new look Wisconsin is going to send their tight end number 84 a really versatile weapon in Jake Ferguson back in motion across the formation where he was initially lined up and the second he set the ball is going to get snapped and Colbert is still seems Colbert still seems to be taking in all of those pre-snap shifts and all that pre-snap movement and from there it takes Colbert a second to read the run which is obviously understandable given the circumstances but after he does his keys are still going to be the same as they would be if he was playing the run all the way like we've been talking about all video his goal is to key the left guard in the center to the ball right away it's clear that the left guard is trying to block number 74 out of that left side a gap and it's also clear that the center is trying to work number 54 out of that left side a gap as he turns his hips out to the right unfortunately due to all that pre-snap movement Colbert loses sight of his keys a little bit and he ends up getting sucked toward the right side of the line of scrimmage instead of aggressively hitting that running lane and as a result Colbert ends up getting washed out of the play here by the tight end who ends up working to that second level which is very reminiscent to the play we saw earlier with Doyle and the end result here is Taylor once again is getting freed in space and it's once again a big chunk for Wisconsin to keep their drive alive and here's the thing you have to respect all those pre-snap motions that Wisconsin runs because if you don't and you just stay fixated on the run the entire time plays like this happen where they'll occasionally hand it off for a change to that jet motion guy and as you can see Wisconsin's run threat is so real and so respected 
and in the mind of Iowa's defense constantly that even the boundary guys are taking notice and will occasionally end up losing contain off play action or off a uh, fake handoff, which leads to a big play. And in this example, it results in a touchdown. And there's one thing that's also really important to note, and it's something you haven't really noticed in these examples, and that's because it's too few and far between when it comes to Iowa's typical performance against Wisconsin. And that thing is penetration up front on the defensive line. Good penetration, or even a player holding his ground up front, is equally as important as good linebacker play. And I know we've been spotlighting a lot of struggles with Iowa's linebacker play up to this point, but the one thing you might not have noticed on all of these examples is how I keep saying that a Wisconsin offensive lineman ends up winning his matchup. And more often than not, Iowa's defensive line is getting completely washed out of the framework of a play, and as the game goes on, as you can see, it can get really ugly because Wisconsin's offense can wear you down. You know, they're running their ball, they're physical up front, they're bigger than the players that Iowa has on the defensive line, and they're not gonna stop coming. If you wanna be successful against Wisconsin's running game, you gotta find a way to flip the script and disrupt what they're doing. And a big part of that, especially against Wisconsin, comes down to getting that penetration inside, winning one-on-one -on -one battles, and coupling those two things with clean and effective linebacker play. When you look at a team like Ohio State, for example, their defense is one of the few in the past few years that has consistently been able to out badass or shut down Wisconsin's run game. And they've done that by doing what we just talked about. With the Buckeyes, they've done a really great job at getting penetration up front, along with forcing, occupying, and even splitting double teams. And their linebackers feed off that penetration up front and are kept clean and are able to move around the field with aggression and confidence while fully trusting their keys and executing accordingly. In addition, although it does go against Iowa's typical approach when playing Wisconsin, or any offense for that matter, Ohio State has also shown a lot of effectiveness by calling well-timed blitzes with linebackers and defensive backs to not only combat Wisconsin's run game, but also just to keep Wisconsin's offense on their toes by mixing up their looks from pre-snap to post-snap. With all that said, Although we've been focusing so much on Wisconsin's running game, and obviously for good reason, I mean, that's the lifeblood of their offense, right? But they also mix in a really well-called timing-based passing game, and when they have even somewhat capable QB play and a guy who can make a variety of throws going along with those motions, it adds even more depth to this dangerous offense because it forces opposing defenses to actually respect the spread looks that they like to line up in. And in those Ohio State examples that we looked at, the reason a team like Ohio State can blitz Wisconsin like they do without getting burned a lot is because of their cornerback talent. And in particular, their cornerback talent is so rare because they really trust those guys to work out on islands a lot. And Iowa rarely allows their guys to operate like that, especially against Wisconsin and especially in recent years because Wisconsin has really fielded some quality talent at receiver to go along with what everyone already acknowledges is highly quality talent at the tight end position more often than not. But at the end of the day, y'all, the reason Iowa's defense struggles so much to stop Wisconsin's offense truly comes down to individual execution. And if you've ever listened to a pregame or a postgame press conference, or if you even played football yourself, I'm sure you've heard a coach talk about execution and that word is not as much coach speak as you might think. And like we talked about earlier, especially at Iowa, there's truly a mentality and a belief that their guys are better than the guys that they're going up against, or at the very least, a mentality that each individual is capable of executing at a high level. And the system they run, the plays they call, you're not going to see a whole lot of blitzes and you're not going to see them overloading guys in the box and leaving those corners without safety help over top. That's just not who they are. And that means that each individual on defense 
needs to be accountable. They need to execute. And simply put, they need to be able to perform up to the standard that's expected of them when they put on the uniform at the University of Iowa. And when you're playing a team like Wisconsin, if you want to come out with a win, you really got to perform up to that standard and then some. With that, I want to thank you all for checking out today's video. And if you'd like another one centered around Iowa's offense and how they match up against Wisconsin, definitely show some love. And you can do that by either dropping a like or even sharing the video. And if you have a question or a comment or even an idea for a future video, feel free to comment wherever you're seeing this. Or you can follow me and tweet me on Twitter at RobDFB. But like I've been saying, on, on the, you know, I say it every single video, but it's so true. The love y'all have been showing on these has been so awesome. And interacting with all of you is what I honestly look forward to the most. And I see all the places these videos are getting posted. So if you leave a comment, I'll definitely see it. And with that said, I will see you all in a future video. Take it easy.